Alrighty, so we finished sections 1.1 and 1.2 yesterday. Um, so now we're just moving on to 1.3. We're actually gonna finish chapter one today. So we'll go through 1.3 and 1.4, um, and then we will start the first section of chapter two as well. I did see that some of you already started the homework. Um, I think I have like two students that have started it. Um, so that's great. Um, get that Connect Math set up as soon as you can because you're gonna wanna start working on the first homework um, because we will have a quiz on Thursday. So just a reminder, there will be a quiz on Thursday at the end of class. Um, and it will be covering homework one slash chapter one. So after today, we've covered all of chapter one and you have all the content that you should need to study for the quiz on Thursday. So just a reminder to get started on that homework as soon as you can. Um, and if you're having any issues with Connect Math, please reach out to me and let me know so I can help you because I don't want you to fall behind. Um, but I can't do anything to help if I don't know there's a problem. Okay. So section 1.3 is on data collection and sampling techniques. Um, so we talked a little bit about how when you're um, you know, doing statistics, you're gonna do studies and you're gonna end up collecting data. Um, so this section just talks about what are the ways that you can collect data um, and different techniques for that. And we'll see some are better than others. So uh, first of all, data can be collected in a variety of ways, and the most common way is known as a survey. So, most common way is a survey. Um, and there's a few types here. There's three types listed. Um, I think the textbook is slightly outdated because <laughs> the first thing that I thought of was like an online survey. So as soon as I saw survey, I thought, oh, okay, like, you know, sometimes companies or, um, like workers at a store will ask you to do a survey or something. Um, so that was my first thought. And then when I read these, I was like, hmm, none of these have online as an option, which is interesting. Um, but we'll just talk about the ones that the textbook mentions. Um, so the first one would be a telephone survey. First one would be a telephone survey. Um, and for each of these, we have some advantages and disadvantages. Um, like I said, this probably seems a little outdated. Um, for a lot of you, it seemed outdated for me. Um, but the advantages to a telephone survey is that it is less costly than a personal interview. Um, so one of the other survey options is doing a personal interview and a telephone survey is gonna be a little less expensive. So that's a pro. Um, people also may be more candid on surveys on the phone. So I don't know about you, but if I'm gonna say something that's probably not very positive, I'm more likely to say it when I'm not face to face with someone. It just feels more comfortable. <laughs> so you might have people be more candid over the phone as opposed to in person. Uh, but there are some disadvantages that not everyone has a phone or a published number um, and maybe won't answer it. So I don't know about everyone else, but when I get a call that either says it might be spam or it's something that I don't know, I don't answer it. So that's a disadvantage here. Um, a lot of people have cell phones instead of landlines. I don't have a landline anymore. Um, and so cell phone numbers are not usually like readily available to a lot of companies or people that are looking to conduct surveys. Um, one other thing is maybe the tone of voice of the interviewer. So maybe someone is interviewing you over the phone and their tone that they're using might kind of affect how you answer questions. Um, so just a few disadvantages. Um, basically not all people have a chance of being surveyed over the phone. Um, those are just a few things about telephone surveys. Um, then we also have a mailed questionnaire, which to me also seemed outdated. I don't know, but maybe I'm just too technologically uh, advanced here or something. Um, but there are also some advantages and disadvantages to this. Uh, advantages being that you can cover wider geographic area than a phone survey or maybe a personal interview. So with a mail survey, you could send these to a lot of different people, um, ones that maybe you're not geographically close to. Um, something else is that you can also remain anonymous if you respond. So maybe you send something back in via mail and you just don't put a return address. You can be anonymous. That's kind of nice. Uh, something else is that it's also a little less expensive than a personal interview. Some disadvantages would be that you might have a low number of responses. So um, you might not have a lot of people that care to fill something out and send it in via mail. I'm probably one of them. Um, you may have some inappropriate answers to questions since it is anonymous and you cannot track back who answered them. 
Um, and then also if you have some people that may not understand questions or have lower reading uh, abilities, you might not get like the responses that you're looking for. So just some things to consider. Um, and the last one would be a personal interview. Um, so the personal interview has the advantage that you can get in-depth responses to questions. So if I'm doing a personal interview with someone, maybe they're going to tell me more um, in person than they would maybe write down if I had them mail back something in. And maybe you'll be able to read their like tone or um, expression a little better in person. But some disadvantages is that for a personal interview, you really need interviewers that are trained on asking questions and recording responses. Um, writing down everything that people are saying or either like uh, recording it with like your phone or some audio device. So you need someone that knows how to do all that. Um, it's pretty costly. So doing a personal interview would be the most costly out of the three options. Uh, and there may be a bias in selecting participants. So if you're doing something in person, maybe you're more biased when you pick who you interview. So just some different types of surveying to think about. Um, these are all in the textbook again, so not too much to go into here. Okay, um, so now we have some sampling techniques. Um, so we want to collect, so or we talked about the other day how when you're doing some form of like a survey or collecting data um, and you look at the population versus your sample. So you have the population, um, which is your whole group of people that you want to do a study on, um, but usually we just take a sample because it's too expensive to do a study on our whole population. So now we get into some techniques about how would you actually like do this sampling? Um, how would you pick who you're going to survey? So no, we can't do the whole population. We need to pick a sample. Um, but how would you pick that? Um, because you really don't want to be biased in choosing um, who you're going to survey. So like something that um, the textbook mentions is, you know, standing on a street corner during the day is not going to be an unbiased sample because you're only gonna get people that are out walking during the day and you're not gonna get any responses from people that are working or other places during the day. So um, just something to think about is how to possibly get an unbiased sample. So we have four methods for doing that um, and those are what we're gonna talk about right now. Um, so like it mentions up here, uh, samples need to be representative of the population or else they are meaningless. So that's what I mean when I say, if you just stand on a street corner during a very specific time frame, you're not going to get a sample that represents the whole population. Um, so that's where we get into these sampling techniques. All right, so the first one that we're going to talk about is random sampling. So uh, definition, this uses chance methods or random numbers to select the sample. Everyone or everything from the population has the same chance to be selected for the sample and it is the best way of obtaining a representative sample. Um, so this is just how it sounds. It is very random. Um, and the key part of this definition is that everyone has the same chance to be selected. Um, so an example of what this would look like um, is maybe taking your population and maybe numbering your subjects. So maybe your population is 500 people. So you know that you have 500 and you wanna take a sample from this. So you can use something like a random number generator. So let me write that down. So first you would have your subjects numbered. So you would number subjects. And then maybe you would use a random number generator on a computer or a calculator just to get like, I don't know, if you want to have your sample be 100 people, you'd get 100 random numbers. And then you'd say, okay, I'll take person 67, person 54, person three, just a bunch of random numbers. And that would be your sample. So you would number subjects and then use a random number generator on a computer. And if you Google this, um, you'll find one. So. Like I said, if you have a population of 500 and you want to sample maybe 100 people, you could just get 100 random numbers that range from 1 to 500 and then choose those numbers as people. So that's one method. Um, as you can see, everyone would have the same chance to be selected. It has nothing to do with any characteristic of the things or people that you're selecting. Um, it is completely random. Any questions on that one? Okay, um, 
our next one is called systematic sampling. Um, and this is defined as numbering each subject of the population and then selecting every case subject. So this looks something like, I'm gonna use like a similar example. So if you have 500 people and maybe um, you wanna pick every 10th person. So you would have them numbered and you'd say, okay, I'll take every 10th person and that'll be my sample. That's just another option. Instead of doing like a random number generator, you could just go every 10. Um, so an example of this would um, maybe be selecting every 10th item from an assembly line and you're testing for defects. So, right so selecting every 10th item. from an assembly line to test for defects. So let's say you just want to collect some data on um, like a factory and maybe like the percentage of items that are produced with defects. Okay, well, you can't check every single item. That would take way too long. So instead you just say, okay, I'm gonna use systematic sampling and I'll select every 10th item or every seventh, every sixth, something. Um, the key thing here is that you select every K subject where K is just a number. Okay, any questions on this one? Okay, so our next one is called stratified sampling. Um, and this is a little different here. Um, so stratified sampling divides the population into groups um, according to some characteristic that is maybe important to the study. And then you randomly sample from each group. So essentially you take your population and divide it into subgroups, and then you take a random sample from each subgroup. So um, maybe an example would be something like you want to know about like how high school students feel about something, um, some issue. Um, and so you take subgroups of like freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors, and you take a certain amount of students from each group. So that kind of makes sure that you get um, like a, a pretty even like perspective almost. So you make sure that you get like, I don't know, 10 from each group. Right. So let's say that you that you want to know how high school students feel about some like, I don't know, issue or something going on. Um, and how maybe their opinions differ based on what year they are. Their opinions differ based on gear. So your subgroups that you form could be freshmen. You could have freshmen, sophomores. and then juniors, and then seniors. So just to like provide some insight on how this would differ from like some of the other ones we talked about. So let's say like, um, instead we did this example with systematic sampling. So that would say like, okay, we take the whole high school, every single class, um, like let's say we have maybe 2000 students, and then we take like every 10th student just number them randomly and then take every 10th one. Well, by doing something like that, you might not get like an even amount of freshmen, even amount of sophomores, juniors, and seniors. You could get like a ton of freshmen and like a few sophomores, something like that. Um, so your number that you would be surveying from each class would not be the same. So if you're interested in surveying like the same number of freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors, you could divide them into subgroups and then take a random sample from each subgroup. That's kind of how this differs here. Um, and that one's stratified sampling. Okay, 
So one more, this one is called cluster sampling. So cluster sampling um, is when you take the population, divide it into groups called clusters um, by some means such as maybe geographic area or schools in a school district, et cetera. Um, and then you randomly select some of the clusters and you use all members of the cluster. So it differs from stratified because in stratified we took groups and we took a random sample from each group. Instead, clustering looks like, okay, I form groups and then I just take um, a randomly selected number of the groups and I take everyone from that group. Um, so an example of something like this would maybe be if you want to survey, You want to survey people who live in apartments. So let's say maybe you have 10 buildings. So there are 10 buildings in like some area that you'd like to survey. What you would do is you would randomly select two buildings and survey all of the residents. You can see how instead of maybe taking um, like a random sample from each apartment building, I randomly select two buildings and take all of the residents from those buildings. So randomly select two buildings and then survey all residents in those two buildings. Okay, so that's the last one, um, clustering. So let's talk about quickly just the difference between stratified and clustering, because I know they're kind of similar with the fact that you separate people into groups, um, and then you randomly pick some people from the groups, but in a little bit of a different way. Um, so let's just emphasize the difference here. So difference between stratified random sampling and cluster sampling. Um, is that with stratified, you are going to divide into groups of interest and randomly take a certain number from each group. So key thing is that you divide into groups and then randomly take a number from each group. With clusters, we divide into groups and then we randomly select a sample of groups and take everyone in those groups. So it's divide into groups, select some of the groups and take everyone in those groups to be in the study. So that's the difference between the two of them. Um, are there any questions on those four techniques that I talked about? All right, cool. So, oh, there's a chat. Yeah, perfect. Um, so with stratified, you would be saying maybe, okay, so I take my four groups and from each group, let's say I'm taking randomly 10 people. So like with my high school example, um, let's say I have freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors, and I'm going to say, okay, I'll randomly select 10 people from each class. Okay, well, I have a variety now. I have 10 from each class that I have. Um, where clustering would maybe say, okay, I'm going to randomly select either all of the freshmen, all of the sophomores, all of the juniors, or all of the seniors. And I'm going to take all of that group. So I'm taking one of my groups and taking everyone from it instead of taking a few from each group. Um, so just to make sure that that is like super clear, I have a little activity. So I made a little poll on Zoom um, and it has four questions. So it has four little examples. Um, it gives you like I guess it kind of gives you some scenarios um, about surveying or sampling, and it tells you how the sampling was done, and then you're just going to select which one you think it is. Um, it's anonymous, so I won't know who answered what. Um, there are four questions, so uh, one of them would be cluster, one stratified, one's random, and one systematic. So there's one of each. Um, so I will let you guys work on that for just like a minute or two, um, and then that way I can just see how everyone's doing with these.
And like I said, it's completely anonymous. Okay, so I launched the polling and you can go ahead and give that a shot. So it looks like six of you or seven of you have done it. So I'm just going to give like another 30, 40 seconds to finish up. Good. Okay. So all of you did it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and end the polling. So I'll share the results so everyone can see it. Um, so on number one, yeah, most of you said it was clustering, which is great. Um, and that's the correct answer. Um, so it's clustering because we have 10 hospitals. Um, so we have these natural groupings. So we have these natural 10 groups, each one's a hospital. Um, and the researcher picks one of the groups and surveys everything there for 24 hours. So they took one group and collected records for a 24 hour period on all emergencies there. So that's great. So everything was um, clustered into groups and one group was picked and everything was used from that. Uh, question two. So yes, most of you said that it was stratified, which is great. Um, that is correct. So uh, the key thing here is that the researcher divides the group according to um, a few different things here, and then randomly select six students from each group. Okay, um, number three. Yes, most of you said it was random, which is great. Um, so subscribers to a magazine are numbered, and then a sample of these is selected using random numbers. So um, that would be random because it's completely random numbers that they uh, and then number four, every 10th bottle of energized soda is selected and measured. Um, and yes, that's systematic because we picked every 10th bottle. Okay, um, I'll stop sharing the results, but great job. Majority of you got the correct answers, so I think we're good to continue on. Okay, um, there's one last thing in section 1.3. Um, and this just goes over something that's the least representative sampling technique. Um, so this is called convenience sampling, um, which by the name, it should probably be apparent that it's probably the least representative um, because it's named after its convenience. Um, and it says selecting subjects that are simply convenient for the researcher. Uh, so that just means that if you were maybe conducting a survey, you're just doing whatever's convenient for you. So instead of making sure that you're getting a good sample of everyone, you're just picking whatever is convenient. So um, an example of something like this would be something similar to what I mentioned earlier about maybe standing on a street corner and like only um, surveying people in the morning. But uh, maybe another thing is surveying all customers who come to the mall in the morning. So that's a good example of this one. So surveying all 
customers. who come to the mall in the morning. And maybe this is convenient for the researcher. Uh, maybe this is when they have time to do it is in the mornings. Um, but obviously, you're not going to get a good representation there because you're excluding anyone that might be busy doing something else in the morning. So anyone that works in the morning, um, you're not going to get their perspective on what you're trying to survey or sample. So this is not um, not representative of the population. Um, so anything that's usually pretty convenient is probably not going to be a good representation. That about sums up section 1.3. Uh, before I move on, are there any questions on anything that I talked about? Okay, and if you do have any questions, feel free to send a chat right in the middle of me talking. I do not mind pausing and answering questions. I'd rather have that than have you continue on confused. Um, so feel free to interrupt me anytime that maybe I misspeak or you have a question. Okay, this is the last section in chapter one. Um, this is observational and experimental studies. Um, so this gets into more like the type of statistical studies that you might see. So we just talked about any types of sampling and how you would pick your sample size. And now we're going to go into a little bit more of the types of statistical studies that you might see. Um, and like it says, there are really two main types. And by the name of the section, this is going to be observational and experimental. Um, so we have the definition already in here for an observational study. So I'll just go ahead and read it and talk about it. Uh, there is actually a typo though. <laughs> this says observers. This should be observed. <laughs> so there's just an R in there when there doesn't need to be one. So it should read researcher observes what is happening or what has happened in the past and tries to draw conclusions based on these observations. So this just means that as a researcher, you're going to observe something that's going on or something that has happened in the past, and you're gonna try and draw conclusions based on any observations that you make. Um, so you'll see the difference between observational and experimental is really gonna be with experimental, you're gonna to try to um, I mean, literally conduct an experiment. So you're going to go through the process of doing something where with observational, you're just going to observe something that's already happening. So there's really no work from you to like interfere or like put on some study. You're just going to observe what's going on and you're going to use those or use that data to maybe draw some conclusions. Um, so I'm going to use the same kind of example or observational and experimental, so you can see the difference between the two. So for observational, um, an example of something like this would maybe be you assess the health of those who eat organically and those who don't. So maybe you're curious um, if eating organic foods uh, has an impact on your health. So what you're going to do is find a group of people that eat organically and a group of people that don't, and you're just going to assess their health. So you're not interfering or really conducting an experiment. You're just um, observing something that already goes on. So you're just taking a group of people that already eat completely organic and a group of people that don't, and then maybe just assessing their health. So doing some form of like a health assessment I don't know what it would consist of, but something just to see, okay, is this group maybe healthier than the other because they eat differently? So that would be something where you're observing um, things that are already going on and you're just trying to draw conclusions. So maybe you find the organic group is a little healthier. Okay, cool. So you found a conclusion just based on 
the way people already behave. So all it took from you was to observe, keyword observational study. So if we wanna kind of transition to an experimental study, um, the definition of this would be where the researcher manipulates one of the variables and tries to determine how the manipulation influences other variables. Um, so this is a little different. You're gonna like intentionally do something to see how it affects something else. So same question, maybe we want to see um, how eating organically will affect people's health. Um, so instead of just observing people that already eat organically um, versus people that don't, maybe you take two groups of people that don't eat organically and you specifically have one change and you tell one group, I want you to change and only eat organic food now. And let's see if there's a difference. So this is a little different because now I'm doing an experiment. I'm not taking a group of people that already eat organic. Now I'm taking a group that doesn't and I'm telling them to do something different and seeing if it makes a change. So I'll write this one down. So maybe you would take, maybe you would take two groups of people who don't eat organic. and have one, one group change and start eating organically. And then you would assess the health of both groups. Okay, so hopefully you can see the difference between these two examples. That one, I was just observing a phenomenon or something that was already going on. And with the second one, I specifically designed an experiment. So I said, okay, I'm gonna take two groups of people and I'm gonna do something different with them. One group, I'm gonna say, hey, stay the same. Or I'm gonna say, hey, do not eat anything organic. And then my next group, I'm gonna say, hey, change how you eat and only eat organic. And then I'm gonna assess your health. So there's a lot more design that goes into an experimental study versus something that's just observational. Um, then there's a little note down here that um, then there's a little note down here that says in an experiment there are at least two groups: the treatment group and the control group. Um, so just something to think about um, that you do need to have at least two groups, um, which is why I discussed right, put these examples in the terms of two groups. So we come down here, then we define them. Um, the treatment group is going to be the group in the sample that receives a treatment or an experimental condition. So your treatment group is that one that you're doing something different to. So this is the one that you're telling them, hey, do this, and we're going to see how this condition or treatment impacts you. So in our example above, this would have been the organic. Because this is the group that we said, hey, here, do something different, and we're going to see how it affects you. And then the next group would be known as the control group. And this is the group in the sample that are treated identically in all respects, except that they don't receive the treatment. So these two groups are treated exactly the same, except they don't actually receive the treatment. Um, so the control group in this would just be that group that's told, hey, stay the same, don't eat, you know, don't eat organic food, do what you do the same. <laughs> um, your control group is gonna help you see like the difference between, you know, making that change. Or not. So you want to have a control group so that you can really, um, you know, collect data on a group that stays the same. So my control group would have been um, the non-organic group, the group that didn't make any changes.
And like it says, using a control group allows us to see what would have happened to the response variable if your treatments had not been applied. So this just gives you something to compare your treatment group to. Um, and talking about the control group and the treatment group brings up a really interesting phenomenon that um, you've probably all heard of in some way or another. Um, and this is called a placebo. Um, so this is a really interesting thing that happens. Um, but first of all, let's define what a placebo actually is. Um, so a placebo deals with drugs usually. That's the uh, way that we talk about it is with medicine. Um, and it looks like a real drug but has no active ingredient. So it looks just like some form of a medication but actually doesn't contain any of the ingredients. So it would be something, maybe we're talking about like um, Tylenol, it'd be something that looks just like Tylenol, but it actually doesn't have anything in it that like is a painkiller or anything at all. It's just like the pill, but it doesn't do anything. <laughs> so it looks the same, but it doesn't have any of the active ingredients. So um, interestingly, um, in an experiment, like medically, usually what you'll do is you'll have half of the people receive the real treatment um, and half of the people will receive the placebo without knowing who's taking what. So it looks like everyone's getting the same thing, but really half of the people are getting something with no active ingredient. Um, so this is used a lot of the time, maybe when you're doing a study on some form of medication um, and you wanna see how effective it is, uh, you'll give half the people a placebo, which doesn't do anything, and half the people the actual medication just to observe the difference. Um, but both people think they're getting something. So this is what's really interesting about that is there's this thing called the placebo effect. Um, and it's defined as when people take the placebo and it works just like the drug or better, um, which is really, really interesting to me um, that you can have people take something that actually has no active ingredient and it can work just like the drug or sometimes even better. Um, and this is usually because of psychological reasons uh, our minds really are powerful. Um, so I think that's so crazy that you can give like a group of people a placebo that doesn't have anything in it, but you'll hear back that, oh, it worked really well and they weren't actually taking anything. Um, so your mind uh, is really powerful and can definitely play tricks on you or convince you that you're taking something, maybe a painkiller or something. So uh, just something to think about that when you're doing an experiment with maybe a control group versus a treatment group, which is an interesting thing called the placebo effect where people think that they're taking something. So because they think that they're taking something, they kind of think that it's working. So it's been interesting um, to think about. So just an example, like I mentioned, I'll write it down, but maybe like testing a new uh, medication. So testing, maybe let's just say like a new painkiller. Um, and then maybe the placebo group will report that it worked. So. The placebo group reports that they experienced pain relief. So um, note that in an experimental study, the subject should be randomly assigned to groups, um, and then the treatment should also be randomly assigned to groups. So when you do groups for an experimental study, make sure that you're randomly assigning people to two groups, and then you randomly pick which group gets the treatment. So just some things to think about, um, you know, pros and cons of experimental studies or observational studies is with something like an experiment, you can always have the placebo effect where you have some people say that things work, but it's not actually, they're not even actually experiencing what you're testing. Okay, any questions so far? All right, uh, so after talking about different groups, that leads us to talk a little bit about our variables in our experiments. Um, so when we're doing uh, an experimental study, we've got two things usually that we're talking about, and that's the independent variable and then the dependent variable. 
So first let's talk about what the independent variable is. Um, so the independent variable is going to be the one that's being manipulated by the researcher, um, also sometimes called the explanatory variable. So maybe let's just stick with what we were talking about in the last example where you're testing out a new um, drug and you want to see how well it actually works. So the independent variable would be whether or not you're giving the person the drug. So you'd have, okay, am I giving this group it or am I not? That's the one you're manipulating. You're getting to change and decide who am I giving it to? So that's what you're changing. And then we also have the dependent variable. Um, and this is the response to the independent variable. And hence, that's why it's called dependent um, because it is a response to the independent variable. Um, it's also because of that, it's called the response or the outcome variable. Um, and so in our example, this would be like, maybe did you experience pain relief or not? So like, what was the response? So independent is what you're manipulating in a study and then dependent is what you're looking to get out of the study. So there's some examples here. So example one is taking a nicotine patch and your smoking status. Um, so there's two things given, so taking the patch and then your smoking status. So how about on your own, try and identify which one would be the independent variable or the explanatory variable, and which one would be the response or the dependent variable. I'll give you a few seconds to think about that. Remember, in an experiment, the independent is going to be whatever you're manipulating as the researcher. Okay, so does anyone want to take a shot at what the explanatory or the independent variable would be in this situation? The, um, <clears throat> sorry. The nicotine patch is the um, independent variable and the smoking status is the dependent. Perfect. Thank you very much, Michael. So the independent would be um, taking the nicotine patch. And then your response one would be your smoking status. Okay, so one more example. Um, we have completing homework and grades. So go ahead and give this one a shot and try to identify which one's the independent and which one's the dependent. All right, so anyone want to give it a shot for which one is which for this example? Okay, so grades being dependent. Yes, that's correct. So grades would be dependent. So your independent variable would be completing the homework. Unless it's like one of those like philosophy questions again, because I actually used to do the opposite because like a lot of homework would only be counted for like 5% of your grade. And I'd be like, well, if I'm doing, yeah. <laughs> yeah, very true. Um, another one of those questions that could go either way. Um, but in the traditional <laughs> way of thinking about it, we'll say that completing the homework is going to be your independent variable. and then grades will be your dependent. So maybe we were doing a study and we're gonna say, hey, we're gonna take some people and either tell them, hey, complete the homework and then this group don't complete the homework and we're gonna see what the outcome is on the grade because we wanna see how does completing the homework affect your um, 
grades. If you complete the homework, is it better? Does it help you study more, go over content more? How does it work? So there are two examples there on the difference between independent and dependent variables. And really the, the, the term itself should help you hopefully identify what we're talking about where independent, you're just getting to manipulate it. And then you're just looking to see the effect it has on the dependent. Which makes sense because the dependent variable depends on the independent variable. Or we're hoping that maybe it does. Okay, good question. So on quizzes and tests, are you going to get questions that could go both ways or should you try and look at each of them in the most common scenario? Um, I will not try to give you anything that should trick you on the test or the quiz. I will try to be really straightforward and give you like common, um, pretty like hopefully self-explanatory questions where it's like, okay, it's very clear. It's not like, oh, it could go either way. Um, I will try to do that. I, I could accidentally give you one that could go either way, not really thinking about it. Um, and if you ever come across that in like a test or quiz, you can always ask me a question and just say, hey, I'm kind of confused. This is what I'm thinking. Um, and I can definitely like guide you in the right direction. Um, but I will try to be clear cut and confusing. They're not here to like, you know, <laughs> get philosophical and like, question your outlook on life or anything. I'm just here to see if you understand the content and if you can apply the things that we've talked about and the definitions um, to a specific scenario. So uh, I won't try to trick you. Alrighty. Okay, so just a few um, things about observational versus experimental. Um, so first of all, we have some advantages here. So these are advantages of experiments over observational studies. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about experimental studies. Uh, we just defined observational. We didn't really talk too much about it. Um, so some things that we have here um, is that we can study the effect of an explanatory variable on a response variable more accurately with an experiment. Um, so yeah, you can pretty much, you know, define your experiment the way you want it um, and set the conditions and you can study it a little more accurately because you're getting to decide how things run in an experiment. So this kind of goes into the next one where the researcher has control over selecting participants, assigning them to groups, and then manipulating the independent variable. So you have a little more control over some of the conditions that go on in your experiment, which um, may work and benefit. And then when the goal of the study is to establish a cause and effect relationship, an experiment is definitely needed. Um, it will help your case if you can define an experiment and run through it and see if there is a cause and effect relationship there. So lastly, there is a typo in the, this bullet point. So it says there are many situations in which an experiment is not practical. This should read, there is many situations in which an observation observational study because we're looking at advantages of experiments so there are many situations which an observational study isn't practical and this could just be maybe because it's expensive and time consuming to sit there and observe some phenomenon that you're curious about so maybe you don't have the time or the money to observe something but you can define some form of experiment that can do the job um, but along with anything, there's also some disadvantages, obviously. Um, so number one being that they may occur in unnatural settings, um, like a laboratory. So if you're doing an observation, you can maybe observe people in like their natural state. Um, you can do it without really changing too much. Um, but then that's also a disadvantage because you're in like maybe an unnatural setting if you have to do it in a laboratory. So you know, there's pros and cons to everything, um, but obviously you're not going to get people in their most natural state if they're in a laboratory or animals, anything like that. Um, when subjects know that they are participating in an experiment, they may change their behavior. Um, this is specifically defined as the Hawthorne effect, and it is mentioned in the textbook. 
Um, but yeah, definitely true. If you know that you're participating in some form of an experiment, you may change your behavior to either make yourself look better or maybe even the opposite way. Um, but definitely when you know that you're participating in something, you might act differently than you would just on a day-to-day -day basis. And that can definitely hinder any study that you're doing because it's not really accurate then. Uh, this last one just says that not all variables can be controlled for in a study. Um, so you can't really control every single thing. Um, and this is when we come into these things called confounding variables. Um, this is also defined in the textbook, and I think they go in a little more uh, in depth with this, but we'll just briefly mention it. Um, a confounding variable is one that influences the dependent or outcome variable, but cannot be separated from the independent. So unfortunately, it's like something that um, influences your outcome, but you can't really like get rid of it. Um, so something that people talk about a lot with confounding variables is smoking. Uh, this is a big one where maybe you're trying to observe something health related, like maybe like your life expectancy or um, I don't know, maybe something to do with lung cancer or something health related. And you're trying to observe some other variables impact on it. Well, let's say some of the people you're observing happen to have a history of smoking. Unfortunately, we can't separate that from the study because that's something that they have and that will affect the outcome. Maybe you're trying to study like life expectancy um, with regards to some, some, some variable that you have. Okay, if someone does this or that, what's their life expectancy? Okay, well, if the person happens to be a smoker, have a history of smoking, that will impact their life expectancy, but maybe it's not necessarily because of the actual thing that you want to observe. It's just something that kind of comes along with the study, unfortunately. You can't really change that. So this is one that people talk about a lot in studies, um, but we won't touch too much on it. Um, you can definitely read a little bit more in the textbook, like I recommend doing, and they'll give you some other examples um, of other variable or other confounding variables. I think one of the ones that they talk about in the textbook is like, maybe you're doing a study on people's um, like level of health or fitness, um, and maybe you're telling them, okay, I want you to exercise 30 minutes every day, and I'm gonna measure to see how healthy you are after a while. Okay, great. Well, what if people start exercising every day? And then as a result, they decide, well, I'm going to eat a little healthier too. Okay, well, then they're going to automatically become very healthy. They're now exercising and they're eating better. But that's not just a result of the exercise. That's a result of them also eating better. But you didn't want to observe that. It just ended up happening as a result. Hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Um, like I said, you can read a little bit more about it in the textbook. But those are some disadvantages of experiments. Maybe you have confounding variables that influences your outcome, but you didn't really care to observe that thing to begin with. Okay, um, we're almost done with this section, but there's just one more page here. Any questions before I keep going? Alrighty. All right, let's finish chapter one. <laughs> okay, so we're ending on, should you believe in a statistical study? I'm sure a lot of you have seen like misleading statistics and things like that, that are definitely made to look um, a certain way, probably on the news or in media, there's a lot of misleading statistics out there. Um, so here's some guidelines for if you should believe a statistical study. Um, I'm not really going to write anything down. I'm just going to read through them and discuss them. Um, so just some things to consider. So number one is to identify the goal of the study, um, the population considered, and the type of study. So it's good to identify those things, see if you can, uh, see if there's any red flags or anything. Second, consider the source. Uh, particularly with regard to whether the researcher may be biased. Uh, so I think this is a big one today in like media or news is really to consider the source it's coming from. Um, who is giving you this statistic? Like, are they doing it for a reason? Are they, is there something they're trying to push? Um, or is there some reason why maybe this might be biased? Three, look for bias that may prevent a sample from being representative of the population. Uh, so there's a few things here. One is selection bias. Um, and this occurs whenever researchers select their sample in a way that tends to make it unrepresentative of the population. So maybe a researcher goes into a study 
um, thinking that, okay, I know that this is what I want to get out of it. So I'm just going to select my sample in a way that will give me what I want. Definitely could happen. Does that make it a good study? No, but I'm not saying it doesn't happen. So, things that you can look out for now that you're kind of aware of all of the pieces that go into a statistical study. Now you can ask yourself if you should believe things that you read based on maybe how they did the study. Um, another one would be participation bias. Uh, and this occurs with surveys and polls and maybe whenever people can choose whether to participate. Um, so when you have people that, or when you have a study that's, you know, where you can choose if you want to participate, you might get like, let's say like maybe you're leaving a review or something, or you're doing a survey for a company. If you can obviously choose, people are probably more likely to say negative things than positive things, if that makes sense. Um, so when you're choosing whether you want to participate, sometimes you'll get a bias that comes along with it. Um, so number four, look for problems in defining or measuring the variables of interest, which can make it difficult to interpret results. Five is watch out for confounding variables that can invalidate the conclusions of a study. So like we just talked about, uh, maybe someone's trying to talk about life expectancy with regards to some other um, input, but they surveyed or did this on a bunch of people that maybe had a history of smoking and it totally made the output look different than it should have been. Uh, consider the setting and the wording of questions in any survey looking for anything that might tend to produce inaccurate or dishonest responses. So like we talked about at the beginning, maybe you're doing like a telephone survey and the person asking you questions has like a tone that's either like pretty irritated, like you might give different responses based on how a question's worded or maybe how it's presented to you. Seven, check that the results are presented fairly in graphs and concluding statements. So yes, definitely check that any like um, graphs or statements that they're saying in the study is actually accurate. Um, because you could definitely get some graphs at the end that look one way, but they're not, or you could get some concluding statements that really aren't true. And then eight, stand back and consider the conclusions. Did it achieve its goals? Do conclusions make sense? And do results have any practical significance? These are just some things that you can ask yourself when you're looking at a statistical study. Um, you know, definitely comes in handy nowadays where I feel like there's a lot of misinformation being put out there. Um, so it's always good to, you know, not believe everything you see and be able to ask yourself some questions about maybe some of the information that's out there or studies that are being done or things that are being said. And those eight tips are going to conclude chapter one for us. So um, before I go on to the first section of chapter two, um, any questions on this stuff? Because you have a chapter one homework due on Thursday, uh, Thursday at midnight, and then you will have your chapter one uh, homework one quiz at the end of class. On the quiz should take about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, that's what I'm planning on giving everyone time-wise. So just at the end of class, like I said, I'll stop lecturing. The quiz will become available um, and probably just 10 minutes to take it and then maybe five minutes to submit it, you scan it, do whatever you need to do. Um, it'll just be a PDF, um, just some maybe multiple choice, short answer questions, just like representative of homework problems or things that we've talked about in class. Nothing where I'm trying to trick you. Um, so just study the stuff we've talked about and try the homework assignment. That'll help prepare you for the types of questions. Okay. Like we're okay on chapter one. Um, so that was just a brief introduction. Um, so we'll just go on to chapter two then. Okay, so chapter two um, gets out of kind of, I guess the basics now are like um, just defining like studies or variables um, and it gets a little into like data. 
So the first section is really on organizing data. Um, so we'll talk about, I think, just one method really of organizing data. We'll talk about one method today that has a few different like classes within it. Um, so yeah, we'll just really do one method today. Um, and this method today that we're going to talk about is called a frequency distribution. Uh, chances are you've definitely seen a frequency distribution, um, whether or not you've done them before or just seen them maybe in like textbooks or studies or something like that. Um, you've probably seen one. So let's define it. A frequency distribution, um, it's the organization of raw data in table form using classes. Um, in other words, quantitative or qualitative categories and their frequencies. So it might sound kind of confusing, but it's not that bad. Um, we're going to examine three types of frequency distributions, um, and this is categorical, group, and ungroup. All right, so we've got the three types, and the first one that we're going to look at is the categorical frequency distribution. And this is used for data that can be placed into specific categories. So we're going to do an example together because I think that's the best way to just get into it um, is to go ahead and test out an example and just see if we get the hang of it. Okay, so like it says, it's used for data that can be placed into specific categories. So the example that we're given is maybe your major, your field of study. Um, and we're only given four. So we have math, history, English, and science. So our goal is to really put this into a table that represents um, the frequency of each of those categories um, or how often that category occurs. Um, so we have this nice little table given down here for us. We just need to go ahead and fill it in. Um, so the table gives the class on the left hand side, which is math, history, English, or science. Uh, because that's the majors that we were given. And then we're just going to fill in the frequencies of each and then the percent. So I'll define what the percentage is going to be, but let's just fill in the frequency. So the frequency is just how many times that occurs. Um, so let's go ahead and do this for math. So I'm just going to circle every time I see an M um, up in this little chart here or whatever, <laughs> this block of letters. So I have one M, uh, two M's, three M's, four M's, and five M's. Okay, so my frequency for math would just be. And now let's do this for history. I'll use a different color. So I'll just circle them in blue. So I've got one, two, three. Five, six, seven. Great. So I have seven history majors here. Two English. So I have one, two, three, and so then in my table I just put a four. Frequency is just how many of them there are. So you're just counting. Lastly, let's do science. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We definitely have the most science majors. You totally don't have to circle them or use different colors. I just did it for the visual of being able to read and see what I'm doing. Um, but you could definitely just look up there and count. So now we have the frequency, um, and now we just need to fill in the total and then also the percent. So the total is just how many there are. So that's just adding together five, seven, four, and nine. Um, and if we add those numbers together, we get 25. So the total there is 25. Okay, and now we're just gonna fill in the percent so let me define percent for you really quick. So in our frequency distribution, the percent is going to be equal to the frequency 
over the total. So for doing the percent for math, um, this is just equal to five divided by 25. And that's just because we have five math majors and we had a total of 25 data points. So five divided by 25 is going to be 20%. But 0 0.2 is 20%. Okay, let's do the same for history. So seven divided by 25 is gonna be 0.28. So that's gonna be 28%. That's just telling us that 28% of the data that we have um, were people that were history majors. And then to do English, we do four divided by 25 and that's gonna give us 16%. And lastly, we'll do nine divided by 25 and that'll be 36%. So at the end here, I'm just going to total up all my percents that I have. So if I do 20 plus 28 plus 16 plus 36, um, I do get 100%, which is nice. Um, but if you're ever doing a frequency distribution and maybe you don't get nice numbers, so like I got pretty nice numbers, I got 20%, 28, I didn't have any decimals in there. Um, so they were really nice numbers, so they add up to 100. But sometimes if you have some ugly percentages and you have to round, um, when you add everything up, you might not get exactly 100%, you might get like 99 point something percent. Um, and that's just because you did some rounding and there were some decimals involved. But just to show you that your percentages here total up to 100%, which means we've accounted for all the data that we were given. So really, this is just a way to organize your data. So we started out with this table here, this mess of things, um, and then we went ahead and organized it into a nice frequency distribution. So instead of looking at that mess up there, I can look now at this table and say, okay, 20% of those are math majors, 28% are history majors, 16% are English majors, and 36% are science majors. Um, and that's a lot more helpful than what I was given at first. So. The goal of your you know, organization of your data is just to make it easier to read and um, honestly just more usable. So this just tells me a lot more than what I started with. So not too bad, but are there any questions on how I did the categorical frequency distribution? Great, um, because next we're going to talk about something that just takes it a little bit further. Um, so we're going to talk about grouped frequency distributions. There's a little more that goes into this, um, but kind of in the same manner, I'm going to just define it for you guys, briefly read over it, and then we're going to do an example just to get into it and really understand, because I think sometimes reading these things and reading steps or things to remember, um, it's helpful, but it's not really helpful until you've applied it. So once you can apply what you've read and learned, then you really know how to do it. So our grouped frequency distributions are used when the range of the data is large. Um, the data must be grouped into classes that are more than one unit in width. So when your range of your data is pretty large, so let's say you have um, some pretty big numbers, um, you're not just dealing with categories. So like in the last example, we were just dealing with majors. So we just had very you know, strict categories of history, science, math, English. Um, this is a little different. This is when you're dealing with numbers as your data and the data is, the range is pretty large. So you're gonna use a grouped frequency distribution um, and essentially it's called that because you're just going to kind of group your numbers into categories and then make a frequency distribution based on that. There are some things to remember with constructing one of these. So we've got six things here, so I'll just read through them and briefly talk about it. Um, so the first one is that there should be between about five and 20 classes. Um, this is how many we think there should be for a frequency distribution. Um, it's not too many and it's not too few classes. So anywhere between 5 to 20 is a good number. Um, it is preferable but not absolutely necessary that the class width be an odd number. 
Uh, this might sound kind of weird. Um, when we get into it, if your class width is an odd number, it will make the midpoint of your class a little nicer to deal with. Um, it's not necessary, but mathematically it is preferred. Um, for step three or number three to remember, uh, the classes must, must be mutually exclusive, which means that they don't overlap. So if you're breaking up um, a range of numbers into like six classes, you don't want the classes to overlap. So like if you have class one maybe ranges from zero to four, and then class two ranges from like three to six, you now have classes that overlap. Like things are contained in the same class. And that doesn't really make sense because then what class do you place it out of? You want to make sure that they're mutually exclusive. Um, but with that, number four, your classes must be continuous. Um, so you should have classes that cover all of your ranges of data points um, and nothing should be excluded. So even if there's nothing in a certain class, you still need to include it just so that um, your frequency distribution is complete. This will probably make a little more sense once we get into an example, but I should read these first. Um, five, the classes must be exhaustive, which means they just must accommodate Every data point you have must be able to fit into one class and only one class. And then six, the classes must be equal in width. So when we're making like classes or groups to put things in, we don't want to do like the first class maybe covers zero through four, and then the next one maybe covers like five through 20. Like you don't want to make them completely different sizes. You'd like them to be um, the same width. Okay, so like I said, I think this will make a lot more sense once we get into an example. Um, but first, we're going to define what class width actually is. Um, and your textbook defines it as it's found by subtracting the lower class limit of one class from the lower class limit of the next class. I'm going to pause on that definition and come back to it when we start doing the example, because to be honest, I don't think it makes a lot of sense without doing an example. We'll come back to why that's the definition of class width. But here we also define it as range divided by number of classes. And this is really what we're going to work with first. Um, so your width is going to be the range divided by your number of classes. And then we have written here, always round up to the nearest whole number. You don't want your width to be like 6.7. You'd like to round it up to 7. Because um, we don't want our widths of our classes to be decimals because that just makes things messy and complicated. So if you do range divided by your number of classes and you happen to get a decimal point, just round up always. All right, so let's get into an example because I think it will just make more sense. Okay, so we've got this example here. Um, the number of unhealthy days in selected cities, and we're going to construct a frequency distribution with seven classes. Okay, well, right below the example, there's some steps here for constructing a grouped frequency distribution. I am going to follow these steps, so you may see me scroll down every now and then just to show you what step I'm doing. Um, so I am going to follow these. Okay. So step one is to determine the classes, and there are multiple steps for determining the classes, as you can see by the fact that there are several bullet points under this. So determining classes is definitely the most tedious, probably longest part of this. Okay, um, the first part in determining your classes is to find the highest and lowest value. Okay. So let's go into our example here and let's try to identify the highest and lowest value in all of these numbers that we have. So right off the bat, I can see that my lowest value is going to be zero. There's nothing smaller than zero here, um, but there are a few zeros in my data set. Then just by looking through all the numbers that I'm given, I have some big ones like 88, 81, but my highest number is 93. So that was step one. So my highest value was 93 and my lowest value was zero. So I've done that. Check. 
right, my next step is to find the range. Um, and if you don't remember this, uh, the range is always going to be the biggest number minus the smallest number. So all you're going to do is take 93 and subtract zero from it. So whatever your largest number is, um, you're just going to take and subtract the smallest number from it. So the range is going to be 93 minus zero, which is just 93. Now we have the range. And then it wants to select the number of classes desired. Well, we don't have to do anything for that because we were told to do seven classes. We already have. So down here we have seven classes. And Okay, now we're told to find the width by dividing the range by the number of classes and then rounding up. Okay, so the width is going to be equal to 93 divided by 7. So if you use your calculator, 93 divided by 7, it's going to be 13.2857. It's a whole long decimal number. Um, but like we talked about, we always round up to the nearest whole number. So we ended up getting, this was about 13.28. Um, and we're just going to round up to 14 because we always round up. So our width is going to equal 14. And now we're good. All right, I'm going to pause here. Any questions? Because I don't want to lose anyone along the way. As long as everyone's following, I'm good. Um, my next thing says select a starting point, which is usually the lowest value. And then we add the width to get all of the lower limits. Okay, so to select a starting point, it says it's usually the lowest value. So our starting point is going to be zero because that was our smallest value here. Um, and then we're gonna add the width to it to get all of our lower limits. So let me kind of, explain what we're doing here. So for our class limits, our first class is going to start at zero. And remember, we're making seven groups. So we want seven groups here. So I'm going to find all of the lower limits of my classes first and then do all of the upper limits. Okay, um, I can definitely go back and recap what I've been talking about um, because like we have 25 minutes and this is the last thing that I'm doing today. Um, so let me just summarize what I've done so far. So, okay, I don't want anyone to be lost. So all I'm doing is following these steps here for constructing a grouped frequency distribution. Um, and so they give you some very specific steps. So there's four steps for this. Um, and the first thing that we're doing is just determining the classes. So I'm on step one right now. So ideally, let me talk about the goal here. Ideally, we want to take this set here, this data set, and we want to construct a frequency distribution with seven classes. So my goal is to basically take and make seven groups that range across all of my data that I have. And then I'm just going to put all the data points in groups just to see how many times um, a data point falls in to each group. So very, very similar to what we did up here with the categorical data, how we made this table and we took classes and then had frequencies. We're doing the same thing except the data that we're given is all numbers. And so we want to kind of make our own categories or our own groups that we're putting these points into. So the first step is going to be to create these groups or classes. And there's a very systematic way to do that. So step one is to find the highest and lowest value in your data set. So by going to my data set, I find that 93 is the highest number and that zero is the lowest number. Those are the biggest and smallest data points that I have. So that's step one. That's part of step one. The next part of step one is to find the range. Um, and the range is just defined as the biggest data point minus the smallest data point. 
So 93 minus zero, it's just 93. So I know that my data ranges anywhere between zero and 93. And then I want to select the number of classes desired. I don't have to do anything for that because my problem told me to break it into seven classes. Um, so I'm good. It told me that you need to make seven classes. Okay. And then it wants you to find the width of your classes by dividing the range by the number of classes that you want and rounding up. So basically, I'm just trying to figure out these classes that I'm making or these groups, um, how big are they going to be? Like how, how much um, of the data are they going to span basically? So what's the width of the classes? What, how big does each class need to be so that I cover all data points, everything from zero to 93. And the textbook defines a very easy way to do that. And that's just taking the range and dividing by the number of classes that you need. Well, if we divide the range by the number of classes that we want, we get 13.28. However, that's a decimal and I don't really want to deal with the decimal. So we are told to always round up. So I round up 13.28 to the nearest whole number, which is just 14. So I know that the distance between my um, lower limit on one class and the distance between the lower limit of the next class is going to be 14. So I was just starting the next part, which says to select a starting point, which is the lowest value. So my first class is going to start at zero, which makes sense because my lowest data point is zero. So my first class will start at zero. Um, and then it says to add the width to get the next lower limit. So that's what I'm going to do now. Um, so my next class is going to start at 14. And that's just because 0 plus 14 is 14. And 14 is our width. And now I'm just going to add 14 to 14 again. And my next class will start at 28. So I'm just adding the width over and over again. And then 28 plus 14 is 42. So my fourth class will start at any numbers that are 42 or bigger. And I'm gonna do it again. And 14 plus 42 is 56. So my fifth class will start at 56. I'll add 14 one more time and get 70. So my sixth class will start at 70. I'll add 14 one more time and get 84. And that's the last time I'm going to do it because I want seven classes. And right now I have seven lower limits for classes. Okay. So now I need to find upper limits for each of those classes. This one's not too bad. Um, so my first class starts at zero and I want to know where it needs to end at. Okay, well, my first class starts at zero right here. And then my second class begins at 14. So if my second class begins at 14, my first one should just be zero through 13. So all I did was subtract one from where my next one starts. And you just wanna cover all the numbers, but you don't want any overlap in your classes really. So zero to 13 is my first one. Okay, well, my second class is gonna end at 27, and that's because my third class starts at 28. Okay, my third class is going to end at 41. That's because my next one will start at 42. So you, hopefully you can see it's like my first class is numbers 0 through 13. My second class is numbers 14 through 27. My next class is numbers 28 through 41. So every number is being accounted for. Nothing is like overlap, but every number is accounted for in here. So this next one will be 42 through 55. And the next one will be 56 through 69. My next one will be 70 through what? Who wants to give it a shot? 
83. Perfect. Okay. And then this one's a little weird because it's not like you have like a class that comes after this one. <laughs> so it's not like you can just say, oh, let me just subtract one from where my next class starts uh, because your last class is your last one. Um, but you can see that by looking at like any of the classes, you can see that they cover 13 numbers. So it goes from zero up to 13. Um, so just by adding 13 to 84, I get up to 97. Okay, so how is everyone on the class limits? Are we good here? Because that's probably the hardest part, I would say. So are there any questions before I continue on to finding the boundaries? All right. Um, so hopefully you remember um, yesterday, we talked a little bit about boundaries, <laughs> um, and we talked about that when we do a boundary, we it always ends in 0.5. It's always one more decimal place than the data that we're talking about. Um, so hopefully that kind of rings a bell. Um, we did it at the very end of class yesterday. Um, so typically we go, try to think of the best way to say this. Um, let's see if I saw that notes Just refresh everyone's memory really quick. Okay, down here, we were doing boundaries. So when we had a recorded value of 12, we would say that could be anything from 11.5 to 12.5. So hopefully that rings a bell when we would like go down 0.5 and then add 0.5 to the other boundary. Hopefully that kind of rings a bell because it's going to be a very similar concept on here. So I just thought I'd point that out. Um, so for class boundaries, it's going to be similar, um, except for on your left boundary here. So on your lower bound on the class limit. So on the lower bound of this one, which is zero, we would go down by 0.5. And then on your upper bound, you would go up by 0. 0.5. This will probably make more sense when I write it out. Um, so if I went down by 0. 0.5 on zero, if I subtracted a half, I would end up with a negative number, um, which doesn't really make much sense because none of my data points are negative. Um, they start at zero and I can't have a negative number of unhealthy days. That just that doesn't make any sense. So I'm not going to do that for the first one. I'm just going to leave it starting at zero. But I'm going to say the boundary is this could go anything up to 13.5. So I just added point. On my next class, um, it goes from 14 to 27. So I'm gonna subtract 0.5 from 14 and I'm gonna say the class boundaries for this are 13.52 and I'm gonna add 0.5 to 27 and say it can go up to 27.5. Hopefully you see the pattern. I take the class limits and I go down by a half on the lower one and then I go up by a half on the upper one. The exact same reasoning um, with how we did it at the end of class yesterday. Okay, I'm gonna do this one more time. So with 28 on the next class limit, I go down and this class can go from 27.5 up to 41.5. I'm gonna do it one more time. So this class can go from 41.5 to 55.5. And then down here, this one can go from 55.5 to 69.5. Who wants to take a shot at what my next class boundary would be for the data between 70 and 83? 69.5 to 83.5. Thank you so much. Perfect. OK. And I'll do the last one, and this would be 83.5 to 
So hopefully you're seeing a pattern there. Um, I know it might be a little weird, like why do we do the boundaries? Um, I remember at the end of class yesterday, we talked about the fact that whenever you're using a measuring tool to get data, it's often rounded. Um, and we talked about how maybe your thing told you it was 97 degrees out, but it really could have been like 96.5 up to 97.5 and it was just grounded. So same reason why we're doing it here. Um, so hopefully it makes a little bit of sense. Okay. Um, so now we're going to finish it out by doing some tallies. Um, so what this means is that we're going to come up to our, um, our data here that we're looking at, and I'm going to see how many points fall within each little group that we have. So we have seven groups here. So I just want to see how many points fall within each group. Okay, so this might get kind of messy looking. Um, so I'm going to use some different colors. <laughs> and cross them off as I go, um, just to make it a little easier to look at so you guys can see what I'm doing. So my first class is from 0 to 13. Um, it can be anything from 0 to 13.5. So let's just see how many data points fall within there. So let's see, I'm just going to go down my columns. So 61 does not fall within there. Uh, 6 does, so I'm just going to put a little slash through it. Okay, 5 is also between 0 and 13. 88 is not, 81 is not, 1 is between 0 and 13. 40 and 50 are not, neither is 32. Uh, 5 is, 21 is not, 12 is. Okay, 12 is, 0 is, 23 is not, 12 is, 18 is not, 5 falls within 0 to 13. 13 falls within 0 to 13, 1 and 0 both do, 0 does, and then 1. And if I miss any, please let me know. <laughs> um, if I count these, I have 1, 2, 3, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. All right, I'm just going to do my little tally. Um, you can definitely just tally as you go. I find that sometimes I forget which ones I've already counted. So I find that maybe I'll be tallying and I'll forget which ones I've already written down or accounted for. So I like to just mark them myself. Uh, but you could definitely like just tally as you go if you feel like, you know, you're careful enough. But sometimes I'll forget which ones are. Okay, my frequency was 14. Okay, let's do the next class. So the next class is anywhere from 14 to 27. Uh, the boundaries are 13 and a half to 27.5. Um, so let's see if there's, you know, any numbers that fall within this class. Okay, so I'm just going to go down columns again. So 61 does not fall within there. Neither does 88 or 81. Neither does 40, 50, or 32. Okay, but 21 does, so I'm just going to mark it with blue. Okay, 23 also does. 27 does, 18 does, uh, 38 does not, but 23 does, 29 does not, 16 does, 15 does, 24 does, and 22. So I should have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Okay, so I've done those ones. I'm gonna give you guys a minute or two to try and do the rest, and then we'll just check it together. So most of them, spoiler, <laughs> fall within the first two classes. Um, so the last five should not be too bad. So go ahead and try and fill in the last five and we'll just check the answers. So I'll give you a minute or two.
All right, anyone got the frequency for the third class yet? How many things are in there? Five. Perfect. Yes, this one would be five. There's also a chat, yep, perfect. Okay, how about the next class? One. Awesome. All right, how about the next one? One. Awesome. All right, next one? One. <laughs> yep, okay, and the last one? Two. Perfect, okay. All right, we're good. Um, so just a little tip, if you wanna make sure that you got the frequencies correct, you can always take and add them all up um, and just make sure that that's the right number of data points that you started with. Um, so if you want, you could say, okay, I started with, let's see. Okay, so I started with 33 data points. And if I want to make sure that I hopefully got the frequencies right, we could just add up 14 plus 9 plus 5 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 2 and make sure that it's 33, which in fact it is. So we've accounted for all of them. Um, now I'm just going to talk about really the last thing that's on this frequency table and it's called cumulative frequency. Um, I didn't, it's not defined in the lecture notes, um, but it's just a, basically another step in your um, table that you're making. So essentially it looks like adding up as you go. So let me just briefly do it and I think it'll make more sense when you see it. Um, so the cumulative frequency for the first class, um, it's always the same as the regular frequency. So the cumulative frequency here would just be 14. And then for the next one, what you're going to do is just add together 9 and 14. So you're just kind of adding up the frequencies as you go down. So my next one would be 9 plus 14, um, which is 23. And then for the next one, you're just going to add together 14 plus 9 plus 5. So you're just like adding up the frequencies as you go through the classes. Um, and if you've done it right, your final cumulative frequency down here should be the number of data points that you started with. So that's like a way to check yourself. Um, so if I keep doing this, my third one should be 14 plus 9 plus 5, which would be 28. And then my next one should be 14 plus 9 plus 5 plus 1, which is 29. And then I add another one, so this is 30. Add another one, 31. And then add two, and my final one is 33. So I did it correct. So the cumulative frequency really just says, okay, as we go down this list, just add the next frequency. So your first one is always the same, and then you just add up the frequencies as you go down. Um, it's a way to check yourself, um, and sometimes it can be helpful in using your data. All right, one more thing to talk about and then we are done. Um, it is just a definition. This is called an ungrouped frequency distribution. Um, and it says when each class is only one unit wide. So if you remember up top, we said that, sorry, let me go to the definition. Um, the group frequency distribution um, is when you group things into classes that are more than one unit in width. So our width was 14. Um, so that's what we had, but if you're able to do classes that are just one unit in width, like let's say your data doesn't range like that um, high, you're able to just do classes that are one unit each, that would be an ungrouped frequency distribution because there's no like grouping of data points together. Um, we're not going to do an example with that um, since it's similar to the other two that we've done, but I just wanted to define it. And that is it for section 2.1. So 2.1 really just talks about frequency distributions. Um, if any of this was a little difficult, I definitely recommend going through the textbook. They go through multiple examples of doing these um, and guiding you through all the steps, just like I did. The steps will be the exact same. So hopefully that helps. Um, but yeah, definitely go through the textbook, try some of the homework problems. And if you're still having any issues, uh, feel free to reach out to me or your classmates. Um, but that is going to be it for today.
So um, thank you all. Uh, just a reminder again, homework due on Thursday, quiz at the end of class on Thursday. Um, I will be making the first part of the project available probably Thursday after class at some point or maybe before then. Um, so just be on the lookout. And if you have any questions, reach out to me um, yeah, at any point. So I also have office hours tomorrow too. So if you want to stop by there, that's fine as well. Um, but I think that's it. So stop sharing my screen um, and have a good day, everyone. And I will see you all on Thursday. Thank <laughs> you.